Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and I know some have been waiting for this one. Let's do it. It's the Hi Fiman Shangri La, the big daddy here. They're top of the top of the top of the line uh, electrostatic headphone. Uh, they sent this to me, Hi Fiman sent this to me uh, several weeks ago now when the LTA Z10E came in as a electrostatic energizer, and I'm working on a review for that one too. I uh, hope to have something out for that soon. Um, I asked hi fi to send me the Shangri-La Junior system so I could use that of uh, the headset and compare their energizer to the Z10e, and then they just completely shocked me. Um, when they sent this, I got a very cryptic email from my rep that just says, just was a tracking number and says, be home for this one, you'll wanna be. Um, not expecting this one to show up at all. So, um, yeah, the headset here, just the headset for this thing, is currently going on a few websites for eighteen thousand U.S. dollars. That's right, eighteen thousand. If you buy this with the matching Shangri-La uh, Energizer that Hi Feynman sells, like that set is fifty thousand U.S. dollars. And I'll talk a little bit about that price tag and what I think that means here as we get into the review. Um, but it's definitely in some rarefied air. And so, uh, yeah, we'll, uh, and I, I struggle to even call this a review, honestly, because how do I review a product at this level? This is the first product I've ever heard um, up at this level. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. So we'll go ahead and do shameless self-promotion and then we'll come back and we'll talk some more about the hi fi Min Shangri-La electrostatic headset. Hey, thanks for watching this video. Please remember to hit that like button and if you haven't, please subscribe. Also, I have a Patreon set up so that you can help support me on a monthly basis and I've set up a PayPal donation so that you can help me out in that way too if a monthly dis a subscription does not make sense for you. Links for all of that, including the benefits in the description below, please check those out. All right, on with the show. All right, so the Shangri-La, often referred to as the senior because there is a junior out there, which I have done a review for recently, and I will put a link to that in the description down below. Uh, the Shangri-La, just the Shangri-La, that's its name. It's not technically the senior, but I may call it the senior here as we get into this review. This piece, I think, really exists more as like a concept kind of, of piece. So like in the automotive industry, for example, you go to auto shows and all of that, you'll often see what's called a concept car where the manufacturer there is more interested in what's possible than they are in what's practical. And I think that is a lot of reasons the where this thing exists um, right now within the audiophile space is when hi fi Min sat down, like when Dr. Fong, I'm sure like this is his brainchild here, like when they sat down at hi fi Min and just said, asked the question, you know what? What if we didn't care how much it costs? What if we just tried to find out what's possible in a headphone form factor? And I'm, I'm betting that that's where this one was born here. Uh, so you've got to understand if you're going to plunk down the money for this, like you're not necessarily just buying the ultimate listening experience, although you are buying that. You are doing more. In a lot of ways, you are helping hi-fi men, or like if you're, um, you know, Sennheiser has one, which I think is called the HE1, or is it the Orpheus? Maybe the HE1 replaced the Orpheus. I'll have to look that up. Somebody will comment on that down below too. Okay, and Warwick Acoustics has a 30-something thousand dollar, um, electrostatic headphone system out too. It's like, so when you buy this or one of those other two that I just named, you're also, you're, you're paying a lot for R&D as well, right? Research and development. Because the tech that you see in here, not necessarily it's electrostatic nature, but if you look at the design of the cup and the headband system and all of that, like, We've seen this in lesser expensive products. Like this 
general form factor on the cup shape has worked its way all the way down to the $500 edition XS from Hi-Fi Men. I mean, you can definitely see the resemblance here. Yes, I realize this is a planar magnetic and this is an electrostatic. The point that I'm making here is like, yes, it's very, very easy to look at the $18,000 price tag and just completely scoff and dismiss it out of hand um, because that is so much money and it is just a headphone, right? I certainly understand that impulse because paying this much money for like a head-based listening system is still even pretty much unthinkable for me as much as I have gotten into and been able to review and enjoy some really high-end stuff. Like this feels like a, like a bridge too far in a way. But again, it's that research and development piece. Yes. This is probably either at or very near, because I haven't heard those other two, the Sennheiser and the Warwick that I mentioned, but this is either at or very near the absolute pinnacle of head-based listening systems on the planet right now. Okay, and I will say, even as in my listening tests, like I would be shocked if it wasn't, because this has just flat out sounded better than everything else completely like just laying it out there. I'll explain why in, in a little bit more detail in a little bit, but just flat out better than everything else. And so, um, yeah, I, if it sounds like a, a, a justification or something like that for its existence, in some ways it is, but there is benefit really in any product category. Like I mentioned the, uh, the automotive industry. Like, you know, there are, you know, there are the Ferraris, the Lamborghinis, the Bugattis of the world that cost into the millions of dollars, right? And, you know, just there's a, there's this cultural air around, we, we tend to be more accepting of people who make that choice and spend that much money on a car than someone who spends, you know, $18,000 for a headphone or $50,000 for the headphone and its matching energizer. But I mean, maybe we also need to think about, um, about how we respond to those kinds of decisions too. Because I think, again, and I think this is an important point, this is after the question of what's possible and not about what's practical. And there is space for that. And again, it does, like in a world where the phrase trickle down is often misused, like technology in product development does trickle down, okay? It does happen. All right, so yeah, let's try to keep that in mind as we approach this piece here. So again, I can't call this a full review just because I have so little uh, context and appropriate uh, landmarks for comparison for this, um, but I will like, still give it a go here. All right, I will give it a go. So let's talk the build here. So what you see is Hi Feynman's egg-shaped model, you know, egg-shaped design here. I don't know if this was the first or if the HE1000 was the first, but either way, this big egg shape here, like, I mean, it's, it's through their line right now. And so, so that's definitely here. And so we get this just huge and you can kind of see it here. Hopefully it's not too reflective in my uh, studio lights. But you can see like a lot of what's going on with the driver and the membrane in there. There's just huge driver area. So the radiating area that this thing has to make sound in there, enormous, right? Um, which is fairly true of Hi Feynman's design of this shape. Like that's a thing that has trickled its way down into lesser expensive models, which aids in the fact that it just throws a huge, huge sound, right? And so that's part of why. You see that we have like the same pad design and everything that you see on like the HE1000 series. Even on this Edition XS here, you can tell that there's just a lot of similarity in the pad design, the pad shape, and, and all of that kind of stuff um, going on there too. All right, um, I can't really tell if it's a solid wood cup here or if it's again wood veneer. I know Hi Feynman likes to do the wood veneer and all that. It doesn't really matter to me all that much. It's 
it's fairly decently made. What it doesn't strike me as is like when you pick this up and look at it, it doesn't feel like an $18,000 product, right? It doesn't have that just ridiculous build quality that your brain is kind of trained to expect for something that has that kind of money or, or it costs that kind of price tag. That doesn't mean it's made poorly. There's nothing wrong with it. Like, you know, there's a little bit of sound there, but it's not bad. Like the clamp force is, is nice. Like it stays on the head reasonably well. The comfort is outstanding. You know, there's nothing really wrong with the build quality. It just doesn't really exude that, oh, hey, I just spent $18,000 for it. Also, look at the cabling. I understand why Estats have attached cables, right? I talked about this in my recent re-review of the Odyssey Carbon. You know, you get a really high voltage on the plates, on the, uh, the vibrating membrane in here, and you've got small connections here on the headphone end. If you bend a pin or anything like that, you know, that you plug into there, you can get a pretty healthy electrostatic shock. And by healthy, I mean not very healthy for you or the headphone. Okay, um, so I get that. But if you're going to charge $18,000 for it, could we get one that doesn't like loop up like this? Okay, so like that's my biggest complaint really about the build. It, it feels cheaper than the price tag, although it's still not poorly built. And then this cable, okay? Um, I, I think we just deserve better than that on a $50,000 piece. I don't know how old this unit is. Maybe there are new units that um, don't have this problem, but I just, yeah, that sends the wrong message for a product of this price. Even so, with that, it is very, very clear that the bulk of that 18K went into making the finest sounding headphone um, head based listening system they possibly could. All right, so yes, it's shockingly light for its price. It is extremely comfortable. Okay, the clamp force and all that, the way the pads fit and everything and the, the overall weight of it is just extremely comfortable. Okay. And so, yeah, it just, it doesn't exude that build quality. And then, yeah, the, the memory here on this cable, this kind of rubs me the wrong way for the price. But let's get into the sound because that's really, really what we're after here, isn't it? And that's really where the story of this lies. So the test gear that I use for this is uh, like I, I use my, my typical Berkeley Alpha Series 2 DAC which was fed in two ways as I did the testing on this. I am um, a recent Rune user, so I have an iFi Neo Stream streamer in for review that I'm using as a Rune endpoint, and that is going coaxial SPDIF output into the Berkeley DAC. Or I also use my Singer SU2 digital-to-digital uh, -digital converter, which is connected AES into the Berkeley DAC, and it is then itself connected USB to a desktop PC running Ottervana. So those were the two main sources there. And then I used the LT-Z10E Energizer, as I mentioned, and then I used hi fi Men's Shangri-La Junior Energizer, which I have a review for up, which I will put a link to down below. Okay, that was the source gear for this. And this is where I come back to, I don't really know exactly how to review this one other than to say that, you know, at, at the price tag, it needs to sound better than everything I have heard come before it and it does very comfortably so okay it sounds absolutely unbelievably shockingly incredible all right um why let's just start with the tonality first of all i'm pretty sure hi Feynman was going for whatever the Harmon curve was at the time they sat down to design and build this thing um it's the tonality of it is as good as I have ever heard. Like there is just no area within the frequency response that I feel is artificially inflated or recessed or anything like that. It's just the tonality of this is about as perfect as you can probably get in the state of headphonery right now. Okay, so it is really neutral. Is there a little bit of warmth? Sure, no, but it's neutral. Is there like that hi-fi men treble boost? Not really, neutral, okay? 
just really neutral. Um, but it just sounds so natural in its tonality on top of that, right? So that's the first thing is like the, the tuning is just about as perfect as we can get right now. No, it's not truly perfect, perfect, but about as perfect as we can probably do on this planet right now, most likely. Okay, again, barring the, that I haven't heard that really high-end Sen or Warwick, but if they could do the tuning, you know, this good or even better, I'd be very, very surprised. So that's one thing here. The resolution is also just amazing, right? Like, how to even describe this? The things that it can resolve, that it can pull out of the signal are just continually flooring, right? Like, I'll give you one example. Like, if you ever hear just a cymbal strike, like on a drum kit or anything like that, if the drummer just hits the cymbal, right, just a cymbal, and that's the only thing you hear. Let's just say that's the only thing you hear. You can hear the sound of the wooden stick hit the metal. This brings that out, okay? You hear that initial attack on the sound, and then you hear the energy of the vibrating cymbal, like the metal that it is made of. Just slowly, you can hear that energy just kind of slowly dissipate, and you can hear that ring of the cymbal just slowly fade out, okay, into nothing. Now, any headphone that's worth anything will capture that and resolve that fading cymbal sound if that's the only sound that it's asked to reproduce at any given time. You put that sound in the context of a full band playing or anything of that nature and they're just, they're not gonna resolve that. That subtlety of that slowly fading out, dissipating energy in that symbol is just going to get lost in the mix. Not here, not here. That was one of the first detail retrieval things that just really jumped out and grabbed me about this headphone is that a drummer can just be going crazy, hitting thing after thing after thing. Okay, and then you can have electric guitars crunching away, you can have the bassist thumping away, and just all of that stuff. It can just be utter sonic chaos. And if the drummer hits one of those drums and then doesn't come back to it immediately, you can still hear that slowly decaying, fading out energy in that symbol in the midst of all of that chaos. It is unreal. <laughs> and it's like sitting in the room with the band because you would hear that if it were live and you were right there in the room, you'd hear it, okay? You may not notice it so much with all the other stuff, but like it would be there if you were paying close attention. And I, like there were just, like when I first heard that, I'm just like, what, what is this weird ring that's happening on these cymbal crashes after this? And then I just, it finally dawned on me. I'm like, that's just the sound that a cymbal makes a couple of seconds after it was initially hit. It's just you never hear it picked out unless it's recorded on its own because it always gets lost in the shuffle of the busier parts of the mix. So that's just one example of the kinds of things that this will, pu will pull out. And so the result is you often end up just rehearing all of your music almost for the first time. Sometimes that's really cool because you learn about more what's going on in there. Sometimes it's not because you're like, whoa, that sounds very different than I'm used to. Okay, let me, let me give you an example of that, that second thing. A track that I've mentioned a lot is Why So Serious by Hans Zimmer from the Dark Knight film soundtrack. That track, in true, you know, to, in, in Hans Zimmer's way, combines orchestral elements, like a big orchestra with lots of acoustic instruments, with a lot of synthesized and even electric instruments. So like Why So Serious at very various times has like the full orchestra going on. It has an electric bass guitar going on. And then it has some synthesizers doing synthesizer things. On most gear, the, the synthesized 
parts of that track sound like they are pretty well and organically, uh, what's the word that I'm looking here, looking for here, that they are integrated. There we go. Like they are or organically integrated into the mix and part of the overall sonic presentation. The Shang here says you didn't do it as right as you thought you did it. Okay, because the synthesized elements almost feel like they're floating in the space above the orchestra. You know, they can pan back and forth and all that, but they, they sound spatially disconnected from the rest of it, which is really weird and different at first. Sorry if that's rubbing on the mic. I will take that off. Okay, which is really weird and different at first. But it started to make sense to me after a while because, like, yeah, if you're, it, it's, it's very different to put in a mix and then to place in the soundscape acoustic instruments recorded in a room versus synthesized or like distorted electric instruments that are inherently like done mostly in the electric, you know, the electronic domain. They don't really exist in a space so much like acoustic instruments do. And this, more than Susvara, more than Utopia, more than the Shang Jr., more than the Stax headphones that I had about a year ago and all of that to check out, like, this one separates those things out from each other more. Is that good or bad? What do you like? Okay, I eventually got used to it and appreciated just the the brutal honesty and just seeing what the truth of things really were like but you know you get all that stuff you hear the noise floor change when samples come in and out you know and all of that which is you know common on really high-end gear but just more so here so you do like re-hear the music a lot i got used to it more often than not um you may not okay so yeah just a stunning amount of resolution the one of the biggest sound stages, but also one of the most holographic sound stages that I have ever heard. Not one of, the most holographic. I don't know about it if it's truly the biggest from a sound stage. It's quite large though. But the, the, the positional effects in all three dimensions of just being, being able to place sounds naturally so you know where they are, you know where the boundaries of those sounds are, and all of that, just amazing. Okay, and then like even though it is an electrostatic headphone, like this is the last like gushing point that I want to make and then I think we can wrap it up. Like even though it's an electrostatic headphone, it doesn't really sound electrostatic-y to me. It just sounds so lush and natural and, and you know, and the timbre, just everything just seems so spot on. Like it's, electrostats, um, in a, in a reviewer roundtable episode that I did recently with, with Golden Sound, Kurawong, and Passion for Sound, Golden Sound made a good point um, in that, and I will link to that, that podcast down below, but Golden Sound made a, re a really good point that electrostats are much quicker in their decay than most planar magnetic or dynamic driver headphones. And so like the the sound can almost sound like a little bit dry like a little bit over damped and and trails off too quickly as a result of that so it can sometimes sound not quite right and even though they may like measure with lower distortion and be more true to the signal like that like i don't think i don't know of any music mixer producer masterer anything like that out there who masters on electrostat headphones they are probably using dynamic driver um, speakers, maybe dynamic driver headphones, even more maybe plain our uh, magnetic driver headphones, which are a little bit longer on the decay. So even though the signal may say one thing, what that translates to in the studio is something that may just live a little bit longer than the signal indicates that it should. And so as a result of that, sometimes e-stats can just sound a little too dry and just not quite right. Somehow, somehow, this one, even though it is so fast and so detailed and all of that, it, it to my ear seems to avoid that pitfall of just sounding too quick, too 
electrostaticy, quite frankly. Like whatever the Hi Fi Man has done on the decay there to make it fast, but also make it sound natural. And it might just come back to just how amazingly resolving it is, is that it picks up the trailing edges of tones naturally and resolves them so well. Like that might be all, really all that it, there is to it, maybe. Um, but it just, it's really surprising that it just, it sounds the least electrostatic E of the E stats that I've heard, which include the Shang Jr., the Odyssey Carbon, and the Stax SR009 and 009S. So anyway, um, yeah, there really are no sonic draw drawbacks that I could hear. It never goes sharp or sibilant in the treble unless it's in the recording. It always sounds extremely natural and realistic in both tonality and timbre. The resolution is just hard to describe, okay? Um, the spatial presentation is so three-dimensional and holographic, and it's got that hi-fi men grandiosity to its scope and its scale um, to go with it. The dynamics um, are good. They're not going to be like really aggressive and hard-hitting like a Fostex or a Focal or even like uh, an Odyssey planar typically is. But again, it's just it's as dynamic as it needs to be. It feels like when the track asks it for hard hitting, it will give you a good healthy thump. Okay. Um, when the track is a little more delicate, it will be a little bit more delicate. Okay. Um, so there's just there's no true sonic drawback in my mind, which there shouldn't be. You know, does it sound 100% real? Are you going to confuse this for being at the real thing all the time? No. Does it expose the flaws in recordings? Yes, it does. For, for my listening, that rarely undoes it because like once I hear those flaws the first time or two and I know they're there, when that track comes back on and the shuffle or whatever, I just kind of keep going, right? It doesn't bother me anymore after that. You may be different, okay? Um, but I did not find that to be a problem. And uh, yeah, so... I like to do comparisons on this channel. What comparison can I do for the Shang? Again, not having heard the HE1 or that Warwick that I forget the model number of. Okay. Um, how about the Susvara? <laughs> okay. Hi Feynman's own Susvara. Because the Susvara is an amazing headphone and, in my opinion, is like the state of the art headphone still for non E stats and still bests a good number of E stats in its total Sonic package. Okay, um, the Shang here will make the Susvara sound veiled and tubby when you, like, if I listen to this and then I put the Susvara on, and granted, that is with a different amplification system and all of that because the, the, the Sus is a planar magnetic driver and this is ESTAT, so there are, you know, it's not an apples, it's already not an apples to orange, apples to apples comparison, it's, you know, apples to oranges to berries to bananas, however you want to describe it, right? But even so, this will make the Susvara sound veiled and slightly tubby. And I think that's because, like, the Susvara, it doesn't have the speed on the decay that this one does. And um, so it just sounds a little bit thicker and, and chunkier. Don't get me wrong. I still love the Susvara. It is amazing. It just, to just give you an idea, this has come along and just said, Sus what a? Right? Like, it's just, it is a overall more complete, more convincing listening experience than even the Susvara. Okay. Worth $18,000? That's up to you. And I tried to come, again, coming back to what I said at the beginning of the video, the question really is not about what's practical here, it's about what's possible. I hope that whatever Hi-Fi Man has done here, they continue to find ways to bring bits and pieces of just the amazing performance of this and keep trickling it down to their other models because it is happening. The staging, you know, happening at like $500, at least the size and the scope kind of a thing. Okay, the resolution keeps getting better you know, and all of that. So like they are doing it. It's just going to be a question of over time, now that they know it can be done, 
how do they do it for less money and on a bigger um, scale in terms of being able to produce it on a larger scale, okay? And they, again, they are slowly but sure, surely figuring that out in my opinion. Okay, let's go ahead and leave it there. Um, yeah, so this has been my impressions of the Hi-Fi Men Shangri-La electrostatic headset, at least the headset piece of it. Utterly amazing. If, uh, if you ever get a chance to hear one, do it. Hi-Fi Men has asked me to send this back to them, uh, at least temporarily, so they can take it to Can Jam, New York City here in just a couple of weeks. So you might get to hear this unit if you go there. They have said I'll get it back, but I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I hope, but we'll see. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's leave it there. I'm Wave Theory. This has been my um, impressions of the high fi in Shangri-La. Uh, I don't have any more words for it. Just hopefully you get to hear it someday. All right, uh, please give this video a like, uh, subscribe if you haven't, leave a comment down below. Please check out my PayPal for a one-time donation so you can help support the channel, or subscribe to my Patreon where you get some nice perks like being able to talk to me on Discord um, if you haven't checked those things out. Um, and as always, thanks for watching and enjoy the music.